This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's the Dave Ramsey Show. The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. Christy Wright, Ramsey personality and number one best-selling author of the book Business Boutique is my co-host today as we take your questions about life and about money. It is a free call at 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. You jump in and we will talk. Rachel is going to start off this hour. She's in Washington, D.C. Hi, Rachel. How are you? I'm good, Dave. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? So my question is, I have uh, a rental home. It used to be my uh, home, and then I, I moved out when my husband passed away about uh, almost five years ago. Mm. And so it's been uh, it's been about three years I've been renting it. So now um, I'm at a point where I'm trying to decide: do I get rid of it, or do I do I still keep it? I owe about uh, three thirty eight on it. It's worth about five twenty five. Mm. And where are you living? I, I bought another home. You bought time. another I bought home. another home. Okay. All right. Cool. I did. Yeah. And how's your career going? Well, right now, I um, in October of 2019 or so, um, I started a business, uh, a, t- a tax and accounting for small businesses, a type of business. Not not doing too, too well right now. I'm kind of maybe deciding to jump back into the workforce. Mm, okay. Okay. So that little bit of pinch uh, on the income side makes you look at this rental. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because um, after all the I smoke clears like with the occasional vacancy and the occasional repair, you're not making a ton on this thing. Not really. I mean, it's, it's covering the, uh, the mortgage and just a little bit over that, and that's about it. Yeah. There's not, not much wiggle room in this deal. So um, it just sounds like there's not a lot of reasons to keep it. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of holding on to it for sentimental, but well, you know, yeah. it's a home that we shared with my, yeah. my late husband. But yeah, at this point, I'm I'm at a crossroads a little bit. Well, I understand, and, and you know, part of that uh, holding on to it went away when you rented it, right? Yeah. I mean, that that's like, you know, you're you're moving it from the home where we did life to uh, now a business transaction, but that gave you a little further time to put some distance between you and his passing. A little bit more healing, right? Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, emotionally, letting go of it today is different than it would have been four years ago. Yeah. At the time, I wasn't ready. Yeah. I definitely wasn't ready. Yeah. Mm. So, Christy, I wonder how her business would be affected if she didn't have this strain. Yeah, I'm just thinking about just the progression, even as as you're describing this, Rachel, from like you're saying five years ago, and then now, because even if you do sell it now, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It's still, you're still going to have that emotional pull. It'll be easier than it was five years ago, but it's still not going to be easy. But I just wonder what could be freed up if you did let it go. What could be freed up in your emotions, in the headache of having to deal with it? I mean, r- having a rental is not just free money coming in. Like that, that's work on your part. It's maintenance. It's the, the dealing with the day to day of it. And so, um, I, I think that while it might be difficult to walk through that to sell it what would be on the other side would be worth it. I mean, you have a couple of hundred thousand dollars in your pocket. I'm just wondering if your business might, if you took a little strain off of you and just leaned into that business, if you can make that business turn the corner rather than head back into the workforce. Uh, sometimes stress and the, the weight of several things on you keep you from focusing on the business. And I think there might be a release there. So I'm definitely selling it. Um, I have no reasons on my list after talking to you to keep it. Uh, you're going to be free. Uh, I mean, the, you, there'll be some sadness, but, but uh, it doesn't make you any money. Uh, it, it's, it's really, at the end of the day, from a financial standpoint, it's really not a blessing at this point. And the, uh, having the actual money in the bank out of that equity would be. 
and that'll give you some options. And stay on the line, Rachel, because I would love to send you uh, my book, Business Boutique. There's I cover a lot of different aspects of business in this book. It's your plan to win, but it also might help you identify what's not working. Is it your pricing? Is it your customers? Is it your marketing? What hasn't been working in your small business that you could, like Dave said, improve, fix, iterate to be able to make that thing work in this new season? So stay on the line and Kelly can send that to you. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Noah's with us in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Hi, Noah. How are you? Good. How are you, Dave? Better than I deserve. How can we help? Great. So I am having a tar- hard time trying to decide between saving up for a down payment on a house or investing. I really want to start investing more into my retirement income. Okay. You can do that. So, uh, Great. So I am 23 years old. I just finished Baby Step 3. Um, you know, I, I really, I, I want to start investing more into my retirement just because I see the, the potential outcome of that. And I really don't have house fever right now, but I also want to have enough for a down payment. And, and totally, yeah. I guess, if I ever wanted to get Well, out. what are you making? I make $70,000. Good for you at 23. What do That's you do? Awesome. Uh, business intelligence. Very good. Yeah, and that's going to go nowhere but up from there. Where are you living now? Right. Uh, I'm living at home right now, but I got an apartment. I'm moving into you next month. Okay, okay. that's cool. a good plan. I think that's a really good first step. And if you're putting 15% of your income away in baby step four into retirement, can you not save towards the house above that? No, yeah, I can. And okay. that was my original plan, but I didn't know if I should be setting because it's like almost an extra $6,000 a year I could be saving for a house, but, you know. Well, I mean, and, you know, three years from now, you'd have 18000 you'd be 26 years old. That's not the end of the world. Right. Or at any point, you want to dial back baby step four and we'll do what we call baby step 3B, which is a reduced or temporarily put on hold baby step four while you save aggressively for a down payment, more aggressively. Uh, that'll be fine. But um, you're making good money. And here's the thing. Uh, three years from today, you're not going to be making 70000 in business intelligence. That's exactly what I was going to say. I was like, right. you're going to be making more, so you're already going to make that goal faster. Yeah, I, I think you can put 15% away and still have a house in two to three years, and I think that's a fine plan. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate the help. Hey, thanks for the call. We appreciate you joining us. Open phones at 888 825 So, Christy, when you're running a business or your own budget, uh, projections are good. Uh, looking out in the future and projecting your numbers is, are, are good. Uh, the first thing we tend to do is we tend to just take what we know today and extend that Yeah. linearly. Assuming it's going to be the exact same. Assuming, you know, like in his case, he's going to make 70000 for the next three years. And you and I are looking at each other going, he's 23, he's making seventy already. Right. Business intelligence is a hot topic. A lot of stuff happening with data right now. It's one of the hottest you know, career fields you could possibly get into in the tech world. Right. And, uh, and if he's good at it and leans in, which he apparently is because he's already landing stuff, then he... he you know, it's very possible, folks, that he doubles his income in three years. Right, right. And so you don't take your business income or your personal income and necessarily project it on a line. Like, I'm making whatever I'm making now, I'm always going to make that. It's very seldom you do that. Now, some jobs you're in, you get cost of living raise and that's it. But other positions you're in, wow, you can really be on a curve. And the same thing's true with your business, with a product line or anything else. That's right. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey folks, I got a great option to help you pay for your education. The Army National Guard. The Army National Guard believes you are the next greatest generation because you have proven that even in adversity, that you have what it takes to succeed. That's why they offer benefits like tuition assistance, career training, and a paycheck to help you avoid debt. No matter what your goals are, the Army National Guard can help you get there. Visit nationalguard.com to find out more.
Well, this week is National Financial Literacy Month. Not this week, this month is. And we always celebrate that by celebrating teachers. Because, Christy, you and I both know that teachers make the world go around. The good ones. Yes. The ones that don't mail it in. Yes. We can all look back in our past and go, that teacher influenced me in that area. That teacher, in, I mean, I, I can name five or six off yes. the top of my head that had a big impact. Uh, some of the others, I don't even remember their name. Yep, that's right. But, uh, but they're all that. Coaches, that's teachers, right. yep. these kinds of people come across your life. They, they're life changers. Yeah. The good ones. And so we want to honor the teachers. We think you're awesome. In the past year, you've pivoted. You've prepared for all scenarios. You tried to say stay safe and still love your kids and teach your kids and make an impact on your kids, on the students. And that's why we're celebrating educators with our teacher appreciation giveaway. It's sponsored by Mint Mobile, the affordable premium wireless provider. Uh, Because of the hard work and dedication of teachers, our foundations and personal finance curriculum has now been taught in more than 48% of the high schools in America and impacted the lives of over 5 million students. Uh, To say thanks, we're inviting teachers to enter our teacher appreciation giveaway. We're giving away amazing prizes, like, for instance, the grand prize, $5,000 cash. There's no purchase necessary. You just got to sign up to uh, be registered. No need to sign up more than once because that puts you in the hat, put your name in the hat, and then we're going to do a drawing among you amazing teachers. You go to RamseySolutions.com slash teacher to enter. The giveaway ends April the 30th. Speaking of amazing teachers, we have Amy Burns from Centerburg, Ohio, Centerburg High School, uh, who is a teacher of our high school curriculum, the Foundations in Personal Finance. Hey, Amy, how are you? I am fantastic. Thank you. And yourself? Well, just the same. I'm honored to speak with you. And I'm honored to be with you. So you've been teaching uh, for how many years overall? This is my eighth year teaching. I'm a second career teacher. Wow. Good for you. Thank you. Okay. And so, and, and you've been teaching the finance curriculum, the personal finance, personal foundations in personal finance curriculum, I can't say it, uh, for how long? For about five years now. Yeah. Oh, so most of the time you've been teaching then. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. So what's the kids' reaction to this? They are so excited and mostly because they, uh, most of our students uh, recognize you and your face from uh, their, their parents uh, going through Financial Peace University. Okay. Well, that can be good and that can be bad. <laughs> depending, depending. Yeah, tell, tell me about the cl- tell me about the class. When the students are asking questions, what is the what's the initial response or what's the the que- the type of questions that they have when they first are getting, you know, introduced to this curriculum? You know, it just runs the gamut. They're just they're all over the board. It depends on what year it is, what, you know, what time of the semester it is. Um, but mostly those uh, students are wanting to know, like, what's one thing that they can cut out of their budget that wouldn't make a huge change in their daily life. Mm. Um, another one would be, um, you know, I still have some moments in their life that they can be very impulsive. And what are com- some tips that they can get out of, you know, get out of that habit? Yeah, yeah, that's that's powerful. I'm curious, Amy. So I spoke to teenagers when I first started at this company. And Mm -hmm. one of the things I struggled with in talking to teenagers was that some of them, many of them, didn't really have an interest because money seemed like this far off topic. You know, Mm -hmm. it seemed like that thing I'll have to deal with later. And they had the bank of mom and dad, a 24 hour ATM. So they didn't really have an incentive Mm -hmm. to live on a budget. How do you help them get motivated, excited, you know, about learning this right now before they make all those mistakes? Well, I have to say that I am very privileged to to work in a school district where um, we don't see that a lot. Oh, wow. Uh, we have very self-sufficient uh, students here um, with families that encourage them to earn their way. And so I, I get a very different um, atmosphere here. But as far as that goes... Um, my my freshmen don't usually get the whole financial, um, personal finance idea um, because they haven't had jobs yet. They're still coming out of middle school. But once the kids get into to be sophomores and juniors and especially seniors, they, they're starting to get jobs. Um, they're starting to look at getting a car, et cetera, et cetera. So um, those things are the kids that are sophomores, juniors, and seniors, they have a better grasp mm, that makes sense. of of what 
personal finance uh, is and the importance of They're it. working, yeah. Yeah, that makes yeah sense. exactly. So in the five years you've been teaching this, what are your class sizes and, and how many people have gone through it? Well, I'd like you to remember that we have um, less than 350 students in our school. Oh, in the whole school? So in the okay. whole school. <laughs> we're, we're very small. We're a rural school here in Ohio. And I have had anywhere from about 15 to a full class of 25. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And within the next two years, I hear a rumor coming down the pike that Ohio will start requiring um, personal financial management as a graduation requirement. Wow. I hope so. That's awesome. Yeah, I hope so, too. Yeah, our guys in the uh, our education department are involved in the lobbying in a bunch of states. Uh, a lot of states have made it mandatory. And uh, we get in there and talk to the legislatures as often as we can to let them know that, yeah, this is what the kids need Absolutely. And, uh, because all of us that are adults you know we look back and we go why didn't they teach us this in school mm -hmm, you know we mm -hmm, say that mm -hmm. also that same routine and yet mm -hmm. there's teachers like amy and 48 percent of the high schools that are doing this oh, so uh, thank you. very cool thank you so yeah, much you're obviously you. a rock star we appreciate you teaching this and well thank you we appreciate you taking a second to talk to us about it we're so so proud to be associated with you and i'm proud to have you out there so thank you thank you thank you for being one of those superstar teachers that doesn't mail it in that that really does change lives so you know when you're teaching something and you and i have the same experience as teachers we're teachers mm -hmm. uh in a different vein in a sense but when I mean, we get somebody back five years later that's exactly right and they say man i went to that seminar and it changed my life that's right the information yep. changed my life sometimes they say you changed my life which is not true i didn't or you didn't but right what we were teaching them when they applied it did right and that's what amy's doing and so you, i can't imagine being a high school teacher that has a 25 year old come back right what six seven eight years later and said you know when you taught that you set me up to win with my new spouse and my new kid and yeah wow it's really interesting too because i feel like especially in high school you could apply this to any time in life but especially high school a lot of times those students that come in as freshmen and they leave as seniors they're older and they're taller but they're not acting all that different and the teacher it would be easy to feel like oh i didn't make a difference in their life because i didn't see this huge transformation in these four years mm -hmm. but the seeds that are planted it's amazing how that continues to grow and they come back at 25 and you hear these success stories and i can think of gosh all the people that poured into me in high school, from teachers to coaches, my Young Life leader, seeds they planted that now are coming to fruition. You're seeing the fruit of that. But, of course, when I left as a senior, they probably didn't feel like, oh, my gosh, you know, I, I see a huge change in, in Christy Brown, you know, at the time. And so I just I, – I hope that's an encouragement to teachers, coaches, those people that are teaching these classes. Even if you don't see a huge transformation in your class or in those four years – the seeds you're planting are going to produce fruit later, and it matters. Well, it I mean, you, you were a young life leader, and you experienced the exact same That's thing right. from the leader perspective. That's Rachel right. Cruz was a young life leader. Daniel Ramsey, my son, was a young life leader. And so, again, work, that's working ministry with teens. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I mean, you, you can get some kid who's just stuck on stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're just stuck on stupid, and yet they're still hearing you. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it, it dislodges, the stupid dislodges at some point, and they turn a corner. And you're, you may not be around when that happens. Right. But it, you still planted the seeds in there that caused it to happen. That's right. Just uh, just actually this week, I was doing a Facebook and Instagram live walking through my devotional and I held up my Bible. I don't think I've ever shown it on, you know, on camera. And I said, this is the Bible that a friend gave me in high school. And it was a friend that saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And I don't even know it was present at the time, but he saw something in me. And I still treasure that Bible to this day, just thinking of how far that Bible has brought me. You didn't see it when I was a sophomore or even a senior, but you began to see it over time. And sometimes we get those success stories and sometimes we don't. But it's just a good reminder that uh, that those seeds continue to grow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, the devotional is called Living True, 40 Days to Get Back to You. And you're going through it again on Instagram right now, yeah. right? Yeah, leading people through it in these 40 days after Easter when Jesus would have appeared to people on the earth. It's been a fun journey so far. You can get your copy at christywright.com slash devotional or at ramseysolutions.com. And if they want to follow you, it's at Christy Wright. At Christy on, B. Wright. At Christy B. Wright. On Instagram. Yes, she B. Wright <laughs> on, uh, on Instagram. Be sure you jump in there if you want to join her on that devotional process. This is The Ramsey Show.
Chrissy Wright, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today as we talk about your life and your money. It's a free call at 888-825-5225. Kendra is with us. Kendra is in San Antonio, Texas. Kendra, it says on my screen, you are debt-free. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you, Dave. I'm very happy to be making this phone call right now. That's awesome. How much have you paid (laughs) off? Well, I paid off 59139 in about five years. Good for you. And your range of income during that five years? Uh, it ranged from about 32 to 52. Wow. What do you do for a living? I'm an environmental scientist. Okay. Very good. What kind of debt was the 59000 <laughs> Well, I had about 38 of school loans and 21 of my car payment. So. Okay. All right. So this was a struggle for you, wasn't it? It was. Um, Yeah, I just kept working hard and putting as much as I could towards that. Uh, I got a good chunk of change from uh, some uh, recent hail damage storm. (laughs) So it it made about 8K of cosmetic damage, and uh, I put it towards my car loan instead. So. (laughs) And that cleaned it up the rest of the way, huh? Oh, yeah, it definitely helps. So it's got some dents, but I have it paid off, and that's, that matters more to me. So That's the big next step. Yeah, well done. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank what do you, you tell people the key to getting out of debt is? Well, just keep keep working hard and putting as much as you can afford to, to those loans and stay motivated. Um, I had a great support system. My, my brother and his wife are debt-free. They paid off a huge chunk they went through a financial piece and they they really helped me along the way yeah i mean you pay off ten thousand dollars a year for five years (laughs) making 32 that's impressive (laughs) that's a marathon like that's a long haul what was the hardest part um i guess just making sacrifices seeing that pair of uh, shoes that you really wanted and just said all control and just really putting everything towards those loans yeah, yeah staying motivated that's good that's how's, good. It, how's it feel now that you're there it feels incredible was it worth <laughs> I, the sacrifice absolutely and i didn't think i'd be here at my age <laughs> making this phone call right now so. how old are you I'm 28. 28 years old, and you did this over five years, so you started when you were 23. Yes, sir. Wow. Very impressive. Very impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Well, you definitely helped me a lot, so appreciate so, it. So your brother and sister-in-law were uh, cheerleaders because they had been through Financial Peace <laughs> University. Who else was cheering you on? Uh, definitely my mom and my dad. So. Okay, that's good news. She had good family support because sometimes family goes, "You're crazy. You're always gonna be in debt." <laughs> you know, yep. some people some yep. people have family that are losers, right? And uh, you got you got winners that are encouraging you and lifting you up. That's very very cool. Well, congratulations, Kendra. Well done. Thank you. Thank we've, you. We've got a copy of Rachel Cruz's latest New York Times bestseller. It's called Know Yourself, Know Your Money. Kelly will send that out to you to say thanks for being on and doing your debt-free scream. I'm so proud of you. You're a rock star. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. All right. Kendra in San Antonio, Texas. $59,000 paid off in five years, making 32 to 52. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. <laughs> a three, two, one. I'm debt-free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo-hoo. That is how it works right there. That is impressive. Over five years, that's a long time to sacrifice. That's a long time to stay motivated. That's a long time to stay focused. Like, two years is long, but five years, man, that's impressive that she stuck with it. That's awesome. And, you know, the good news is when you're working this stuff and you're single is you don't have to talk anybody else into it. The bad news is there's nobody there to kick your butt. No accountability, yeah. Nobody there to encourage you when you're down. Yeah. And nobody nobody to hold you in there. And, I mean, she did that over five years and her only accountability was encouragement was her family That's walking right. with her. But, I mean, it's easier to cheat when you're single. Yes, and to just give up on the plan. You're like, oh, this is too hard. I've, I've done it for a period of time. I've made progress. But, gosh, it's just I just want to buy the shoes, like she said. And she just stuck with it. That's just so awesome. That's very well done. 
Very, very well done. That is awesome stuff. Zach is with us. Zach is in Rockford, Illinois. Hi, Zach. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. And thank you, Dave. Christy, nice to be talking with you. How are hey. you guys doing? Better Damn. than we deserve. What's up? <laughs> well, I am on baby step two, and I am debating on whether or not I should refinance my house or sell it and move back into an apartment so I don't have to worry about any home repairs. Do you have home repairs you expect? Are there things, your maintenance issues right now? So right now, not really anything like major. I mean, my furnace is about 15 years, water heater's five. Um, I just had to pay for a chimney flashing repair, but it's an older house. Um, so that's kind of where I'm currently debating. I mean, I've been in it for two years. If I would have taken Financial Peace University before I bought the home, I wouldn't have bought the home, but I took it four months after. But now with the market, what, what, like why would you have position. not bought the home after financial peace? Because of where you were in the baby steps or because it's a bad buy? Uh, where I was in the baby steps, it was actually a, a pretty decent buy uh, at the current time. I'm saying, why would you have not bought the home? You said if you took financial peace university first, you would not have bought it. Did I understand you right? You, you think you are, dead. I, I would I wouldn't have bought it because I was in debt. Oh, I see. He's in baby steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I meant. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So, but now you're out and you're working on the house, right? Uh, no, no. I'm still in baby step two. So I got seventy two thousand dollars in student loans, um, and, what, and with the market the way it is, I have twenty thousand dollars of equity in the house just because of the market. So I'm trying to figure out if I should sell or refinance. Why would you refinance? So I am currently in a 30 year. So, um, you know, I would have did that differently back then, but it's at 4.25. Okay. Um, and after talking to mortgage broker, uh, yeah. I could probably get a 2.8 yeah. to a 3% interest rate. Yeah. If you're going to stay in the house, if you're going to stay in the house, get in touch with Churchill mortgage and do a refi because you can, you can get down under three right now on a 15 year fixed while you're at it, put it on a 15. Um, how old are you? I am 27. And what do you make a year? Did you tell me already? I have not. I'm currently on pace for 60 to 65, so I'm in sales. So How much is your house payment? Plus commission. Right now, it's 646. No, it, would, uh, it wouldn't it, move I a lot off of that because you're going to drop 2% down, but you're going to kick from a 30 to a 15. It'll move up a little, but not much. Yeah, it's only about $100 more. Yeah. Um. The house is the last thing we sell. I'll sell your car in a heartbeat, your boat in a heartbeat, your motorcycle in a heartbeat. They're easier to get out of and into. Moving is emotionally and financially very expensive. It just takes up a lot of your headspace to move. And um, so I, it's the last thing I would do. And I have a sense that you're just starting your financial peace journey. Am I right? I started about two years ago, yeah. but you guys were just mentioning the single part. Uh, so I slowed down a little bit, but I re-kicked everything into gear. I'm now throwing $2,000 a month towards debt. Yeah. Um, so are, are you, are you, ask, are you asking about selling because you just want to make a big, huge dent in your debt? Like, is that yeah, where the just, question's coming from? Yeah. And just not having any stress with like the repairs would be on the apartment complex. I mean, I did the math of, you know, also considering yeah. the water bill and the electricity. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, over the scope of your life, you can do the math. Renting does not keep up with owning. Owning is better, even with the chimney flashing. Okay. Over the scope of your life. Now, in a short-term situation, sometimes owning will be more expensive than renting. Uh, uh, so I think you've just had an, a repair and you've got a rejuvenated uh, desire to get out. And those two things are combining to push you to sell it. I'm going to tell you to keep it for now. Uh, in the spring next year, if you're still limping with this thing a little bit, you may want to sell it. But I think you're going to refinance it and keep it.
Democracy Right, Ramsey Personality is my co-host today as we take your calls about your life and your money. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Mason is with us. Mason is in Lansing, Michigan. Hi, Mason. How are you? Hey, Dave. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Um, so I'm 22 years old, and I'm currently living at my parents' house, and I want to achieve financial freedom through entrepreneurship or starting a uh, uh, self-storage business, and I have $5,000 saved up, and I don't know what to do with my next step. A, a self-what business? Storage? Self-storage. Self-storage. Well, that's a bit of an expensive transaction, dude. That's talking about buying a big piece of commercial real estate. Uh, probably not your um, first step. Why? Yeah, I'm, curi- I'm curious, I'm curious, Mason. Why? Why that? Out of curiosity. Um, I know uh, a few people in my family who have made who have had success in that. Um, they're they're distant relatives, so I don't have a lot of contact with them. But um, I know that they have made a decent amount of money off of that. Oh, it's a it's cash cow. Pretty- Once you get it up and get it running, it's a cash cow. But we're talking about you know, whatever it takes, a half million, million dollars to get this thing planted in the ground, baby. I mean, this is no small step yeah, here. That That's usually so that something was, you would do question. after you've gotten something else going. So your drive is just to make money right now. Um, to practically, yeah. Yeah. So well, you said entrepreneurship. What are you thinking of there? Um... I'm I'm not sure. I've looked into quite a few uh, different sections, but I, I haven't landed like pinpointed myself in a direction yet. What do you get excited about? Like what 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 kind of things get you excited? Because the self storage business, while it's not a bad idea that you want to make money and your family's done it, uh, business can be hard. And so, looking deeper for a deeper passion than just money and success, those things will come. What what what, what are you passionate about? What are you excited about? What 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 keeps you up at night? Because you, man, that that's so fun. I want to work on that. I want to help these people. I want to solve this problem. That's that's the heart of entrepreneurship: is solving problems and helping people. What what is that for you? Um. Well, I do. I do like before I got onto the entrepreneurship uh, trail. I was a uh, mechanic, and I, I love working on cars and helping out people that way. Okay. What have you been doing up to this point? What kind of work? Um, well, like I said, I was uh, I was a mechanic, but due to COVID, I got laid off, and I've been working at a local grocery store stocking shelves. Okay. I make about sixteen an hour. I love your ambition. Uh, as a serial entrepreneur myself, uh, I started cutting grass when I was twelve years old. Had twenty seven yards to cut. I've always had a P and L in my life, uh, and so I, I love what you're trying to do. I love where your head's at. Christy teaches. Uh, men and women all over the world, how to start and how to operate businesses is what she does. She's excellent at it. Um, and, and I think both of us are stepping back and going, uh, hey, let me let me ask you this. Have you ever been someplace and a salesman was trying to sell you something and it felt slimy? Yes. Like he was there trying to make a commission and didn't care about you yes yeah that's what an entrepreneur is that starts a business just to make money you smell bad and you you, don't mean for it to mason it it doesn't start out you don't no but you're you're in it it for you instead of them Mm -hmm. and so what you've got to figure out is is there has to be a problem that you're looking for in the world that God put you on the planet to solve that problem for people. And it could be the most honest uh, mechanic in the world, and you end up owning a uh, hundred shops all over America with your name on them, fixing cars 10 years from now. I don't know. Uh, it could be something else. But somewhere there's a problem that when you solve it for someone, it clicks in your soul and makes you smile, oh, and I can make money, not I'll do anything to make money. Because let me tell you, that that I'll do anything to make money is what's driving the storage thing. Mm-hmm. You had no yes. passion about that at all. All you're running to do is get some money. And we can hear it in your voice. You're just trying to get some money. And that's never going to work. 
business business people who just try to get money smell bad. It's and you're going to give up. And it, when things get hard, because they will get hard, you're going to give yeah. up because that's not enough to keep you going. Let me give you a couple areas of your life to look at, Mason, as you explore this. What are your strengths? These are things you're naturally good at. What are your skills? Any education, experience? The car mechanic would be an example of experience. What stuff do you have? Do you have certain equipment you could use or a laptop or a certain facility you can use for a business idea? What would you, with social, what would you do socially just for fun? What would you do as a hobby just because you love it, just because you enjoy it? Look at your story. Your backstory. Is there something that, man, you had a, a really tough season of life or something you went through that that could inspire a passion for helping people? My mom starting a bakery when I was six months old is part of my story. That's my passion behind Business Boutique. Look at your skills, your strengths, your stuff, your story, your um, uh, what you would do socially, and look at some of these things you already have in you to try to dig out and mine for what is something that is a business idea I could get excited about. And don't get overwhelmed by there. there's only one idea. Just start with an idea that could work. Try some stuff and see what works, but you need to be excited about it if you're going to stick with it for the long haul and if you're not going to feel salesy and desperate for money, which is what Dave was talking about. So start with some of those. I call them my S's. These are my, my five S's. Start with some of those S's and let that give you direction for maybe a business idea that you'd be more excited about than the storage right now and more cost effective by the way now nothing smells quite as bad as a broke salesperson or a greedy salesperson and when you open a business and you're all about what money you can extract from the customer that's the spirit you're operating in and that's what you want to avoid and the problem is there's nothing evil about wanting to be ambitious and wanting to win and going up want to go i want to go, want to start a business i'm going to go in the marketplace and succeed i want you to do all of that but what is the problem that you're going to solve that we can't keep you from doing it once you get lit on fire i mean when i started doing the very first thing i ever did with money was i was just counseling people at our church mm -hmm. as a ministry for mm -hmm. free helping people that were in foreclosure stop a foreclosure helping them get on a budget after we went broke i had a heart for hurting people right. that, that were where Sharon and I had been, and I had the skills to st to help them, right. and I was doing it for free. Right. Uh, you couldn't keep me from doing it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now it's a $350 million business. Right. You know, and, and uh, but it started with that, and that's also why I can't be canceled, because I won't stop. Yeah. I don't need someone's approval to do this. I don't need someone's admiration to do this. I don't even need their money to do this i'll just go You're gonna do, do it. it anyway i'm yeah. just gonna do it yeah and the, the, what that does is it pierces through the darkness and pierces through the bs yeah that is out there in business but the first time you hit a hard roadblock like christy said uh, folks out there running a business you quit yeah if, if you if you're not if your butt's not burning mm -hmm. if you ain't got this thing in your stomach where you're just wired up man and you just can't be denied you I, i'm going you know and it's not about me being rich no that's a byproduct. Yeah, and I think people miss it because they focus on what they get, not on what they give. Business and life, by the way, is focusing on what you give. You give value, solutions, help to people. I see this all the time, Dave, at our events. I'll have someone come through my book signing line and they'll say, I want to do what you do. I want to be a speaker. And every time I'll say, why? Because if, if they don't have an answer of like, I want to help these people, I want to solve these problems, then they're in it for the spotlight, they're in it for the followers, they're in it for the fame. They and, want the and admiration. Your yeah. audience will feel that. You can tell the difference between yeah. a speaker who walks on a stage and they're looking for what they can get. I, can I get a laugh? Yep. Can I get a standing ovation? Yep. Versus a speaker that comes on stage and says, I want to give value, I want to give solutions. And it's the same in business. If you are in it for what you can get, your customers will feel it. Yep. And if you're in it for what you can give, your customers will feel it. Our friend Ken Blanchard says, profit is the applause that your customers give you. Well done. Well done. That's what they're saying. It's a brat byproduct of it. Mason, that's a really good question. I'm so glad you called in to ask it. And uh, you probably got more than you bargained for. It. But uh, I, I, I predict good things in your future, sir. You're a sharp young man. That puts this hour of the Ramsey Show in the books. Did you know you can listen to The Ramsey Show on your smart speaker? Just tell Alexa, Google Assistant, or Siri to play The Ramsey Show podcast. Check out all Ramsey Network shows on your smart speaker today.
This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Christy Wright, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author of the book, Business Boutique, and host of the Christy Wright podcast, which is a big exploding movement uh, is my co-host today as we answer your questions the phone number is 888-825-5225 that's 888-825-5225 ryan is with us to start off this hour in waterbury connecticut hey ryan how are you good dave how you doing better than i deserve sir what's up um i'm 27 years old and I'm on baby steps four and six. And I was wondering if it would be ridiculous or wise to stop making extra payments on my mortgage to save up and build a basketball court in my backyard. A basketball court in your backyard. What does that like a real from? court? Like like not just like a goal, like an actual court. Yeah, like a concrete slab. Oh my. Like a, a full court. Or half court? Uh, I would do half court. Half yeah, court. half court. Okay. Um, what would it cost? Uh, between three and six grand. And um, what uh, what do you make a year? Uh, last year I made sixty five, but this year I'm looking to make closer to eighty five. What's your house worth? Uh, two twenty eight. Okay. And you just love ba- – I'm just curious uh, why. You just love basketball? You just want to play all the time? Yeah. Or is this just kind of like a ridiculous thing to do? Because I'm trying to be wise, you know, and build wealth, and I was planning on paying the house off within five to seven years. Um, but other than that, I was just curious on, you know – I mean, I, it, it, it's, no, it's not ridiculous. I mean, people put tennis courts in their backyard. People put – uh, pools in their backyard. They do all kinds of things. Right. Let's talk about it from a real estate perspective. No, it's not ridiculous, but let's talk through, is there a, is there a better way to do this than, uh, and a worse way to do this? And the answer is, yeah, I think there is probably from a real estate person's perspective is how I'm put that hat on for a minute. Um, yeah. I'm going to build it if I if I'm doing this the for the least money possible number one because it's not going to add a dime of value to the house right so like if you spend six thousand dollars the house is not worth six thousand dollars more because of it as a matter of fact if you do it poorly the house might be less marketable because it's kind of got this weird thing in the backyard for somebody that doesn't play basketball Right, that's what I was. That's what I was worried about down yeah. the line. Like I, you- I looked at a really nice vacation property the other day. That like a super super nice one. I don't play tennis, and it had a fabulous tennis court in the backyard. And I kind of looked at that as a negative, not a positive. It's like a thing back there that I don't need or want. Right. And you know, it was like right. a like a problem, not a not an opportunity. So that's a, if you do it wrong, that's how you do it. So depending on how you're, I, I mean, I'm just thinking about properties that I've owned or lived in. Number one, growing up in Nashville, we had turnarounds that they that you back out of the garage and you drive away, and most of the neighborhood kids, including. When my kids were little, we had a nice turnaround that was paved. In our case, it wasn't concrete. And we put a basketball goal on the house or put one on a pole on the edge of the turnaround. And it didn't really, A, cost anything extra to put the actual surface in. It was a little bit of money to put a goal up. Uh, but, B, it didn't weird people out that weren't basketball people when they came to buy the house. They just went, well, I'll take the pole down, right, if I don't like it, don't want it back right. there. And so do you have, like, a turnaround you could do that with? I don't. But my other idea was to build a patio on the back of the house, you know, closer to the house, and it would be a smaller patio, but also I could play basketball on it and then 
that would be the, the line, same you know, kind of a thing. That makes a lot more sense. And yep. then you you know, and then the the buyer can visualize I'm just gonna pull the goal out, or you could even pull the goal yep. out yourself before you put it on the market, and then you've just got a nice patio you built. Now we're not messing right. with the marketability of the house, okay? And that is less weird. Uh, the only other thing right. I can think of is, it, I don't again, a driveway uh, configuration matters here. But if you don't have a turnaround, if you have a, uh, your driveway pulls up and you could simply extend the driveway back and put the pad there, uh, it gives additional parking spaces or maybe a slab to put an extend or to put a, uh, 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 an exterior garage on someday if he, if it wasn't a basketball court, that kind of a thing. So we've got, again, like like the patio thing, it's got multiple uses, right? So I, I just right. want you thinking that way. Don't stick it back there and make it a problem for the buyer. How long are you right. planning to stay in this house out of curiosity? Uh, well, I wanted to pay it off as soon as possible, and that looks about five to seven years. And then my plan was to either use it as a rental or – you know, resell it and move up in house. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I think you just use some of these ideas we're batting around here and try to make it a, a, a multi-use type of thing. Yeah, where it's got possible other uses, so it doesn't just look like a problem concrete slab in the backyard. Yeah. You know, yeah. like why is that there? I wanted to grow tomatoes there. I got yeah. that. You know, like, <laughs> you know, and that, you know that that's what people will. That's what that stinking tennis court. I mean, well, I, again, that's what another, I, was think- I think it's wonderful if you play tennis, but I don't play tennis. Well, so and, and even can still- I turn it into a shooting range? Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> The thing is, the percentage of people that might buy your house that like basketball is small, and then the people that would want to play is even smaller, and then the people that would want that in their backyard is, like, tiny. Yeah. So you're talking about a very small percentage of people that someone would actually like that, yeah. so the rest of the people you're isolating, so and it's a turnoff. So build it in such a way that it can be something else Yeah. in addition to that, and the least possible cost as well because you're not doing that and then the, and the more you move in that direction the less you are on the ridiculous side and the more you are on the wise side there you go good question interesting yeah, chuck is, is chuck's with us in kansas city hi chuck how are you i'm doing good thanks babe good. yeah i i, I um, i'm 57 and i just came into some money and i was wanting to invest it for retirement mm-hmm. and one of the options i looked at was indexed annuities and i was curious what you thought about that option it's okay i, I wouldn't use it for uh, an actual retirement account because an annuity grows tax deferred and a retirement account also grows tax deferred so it's kind of redundant in that sense or tax-free if it's a roth um and, and you're paying an extra fee for it to be in the annuity so you just buy the mm-hmm. index you buy an index mutual fund inside of your roth if you were going to do that uh, um the other thing I want you to be aware of is I don't. I'm 60 and I don't use them uh, because they've got extra fees. The commissions are much higher on them for the uh, seller, uh, the, the financial advisor that's selling them, than a simple mutual fund transaction. And so instead, what I do with a lump sum like that is I invest it just in an index fund. I use an S&P 500 index fund. I just drop some money in there. And it grows without taxes by and large until you take it out because it's capital gains growth. It is not uh, dividend growth. And they have what's called a low turnover ratio. So study and learn a little bit about low turnover ratio mutual funds. That would be my suggestion But the variable annuity, as long as it's got good mutual funds in it, is not horrible in your situation. What makes our show unique is that we genuinely care about our listeners. We're intentional about choosing the best advertisers to recommend. Blinds.com is no exception. They offer high quality window treatments at unbelievable prices and they make it simple to shop blinds, shades, and interior shutters with easy online ordering, free shipping, and a guaranteed perfect fit. Go to Blinds.com and take advantage of this week's special savings.
Here at Ramsey Solutions, we want to transform so many lives that disruption spreads like wildfire across this country. If you haven't noticed, our culture has become toxic. And the only way to remove that toxicity is to displace it with clean, good, real ideas. Imagine a world where it's weird to have a student loan. That you get an education and you pay for it. Imagine a world where the majority of people pay cash for their car. Imagine a world where the credit card is the cigarette of the financial world. Imagine a world where ladies are empowered and know exactly how to start and run their businesses the way Christy teaches. At Ramsey Solutions, we work on this level of disruption every day, and it's why we have a just under a 1,000 folks on our team right now. And they create digital products and services to help people transform their lives with the goal of disrupting the toxic culture in America today. And if you want to join us on that crusade, we're currently on the hunt for software engineers with expertise in Ruby on Rails, Java, C Sharp, front-end technologies. If you're a UX designer, an SEO, content marketing specialist, uh, digital creative, we'd love to talk with you. We've got about 300 jobs we need to fill this year to be able to do the different initiatives that we've got to help people in America today. If you want to talk about joining us, find out about all the available jobs by texting WORK THAT MATTERS to 33789. Text WORK THAT MATTERS to 33789 to find out about our open opportunities. And you can, of course, also... I go to RamseySolutions.com and click on the right-hand tab that says, We Are Hiring. Lucy is in California. Hi, Lucy. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. How are you? Better than I deserve. How can Christy and I help? So I actually just started listening to you about a week and a half ago, and um, I started the cash envelope system and started budgeting because I am a horrible, horrible spender. Um, so I want to change my habits. I do have a student loan for about 37000 mm-hmm. that I haven't made a payment to since 2017. Mm-hmm. And I also have a um, title loan that I pay about 96% interest mm-hmm. and my principal balance is about 5,000. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, because I am sort of new to this uh, uh, budgeting and I'm trying to be debt free, I just want your advice on how to attack um, these loans that I have because I, I do have a six month old baby that I want to plan for for her future. Good for you. So you're a single mom? Um, no, I have a boyfriend. Okay. All right. So you're a single mom. Okay. Okay. And, uh, I mean, you're not married, right? No, we're not married. Okay. And, uh, what do you make a year? 55,000. Okay. That's good news. Well, congratulations on stepping up and saying, Hey, this is an area of my life that's caused me pain and I want to fix it. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Thank you. Very, Very well done. Very cool stuff. Good for you. So, um, Having sat in this seat for almost 30 years now, here's what I think I heard you say in the background, behind the words. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. How old are you? 33. 33. Okay. And so you've kind of just lived your life and money happened to you. You never happened to it. And the baby comes and you went, oh, crap, I got to be a grown up. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Good for you. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the yeah, good, the I, good I news, and, and I can tell some of that because the, the only way anybody takes out a title loan is they're desperate. Yeah. You felt cornered at some point and out of money and scared because otherwise you wouldn't have signed up for 96% interest. Everyone knows, including you, that, that that's not yeah. a winning proposition, right? Yeah, no. So the great news about your story is is that once you once the switch flipped inside your brain in the last few months uh, and you said no more, I've had it, I'm not living like this anymore, you're going to change things fa- so fast. It's going to be amazing because you're so ready. I don't have to talk yeah. you into stuff. You're like over it. Am I, I mean, is that right? Yeah, 
Yes, I am. Okay. Completely. Well, ob- obviously then what we're going to do is we're going to get on a detailed type budget. Beans and rice, rice and beans, no life. I don't want you going out to eat. I don't want to hear about a vacation. You have a mess, girl, and it's time to clean it up. And we're going to do we're, our whole life right now is clean up debt. Complete yeah. focused intensity. Like, ah! Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And the first yeah. thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this stupid butt title loan and get those people out of your life. And don't you ever go back on that property or call those people ever again the rest of your life. Okay, I won't. I won't ever. Matter of fact, you can take your pinky out and wave it at them as you drive by every time from now on. (laughs) Because I am never going to go in this place again. They screw people. Right? Yeah, no, they do for sure. And I I know this because I am in the financial industry myself, but I... Yeah. Yeah. Well, you had a brain lapse because you got desperate. Every time I get desperate, right after that, I get stupid. That's yeah. what happens to me. It happens to me, too. And I, and I teach this stuff. So we're going to yeah. attack that thing. We're going to be on a detailed written budget. I'm going to put you into Ramsey Plus for one year. It's our online access to everything. It's the Cadillac, the Bentley. All right. And it's going to put you into Financial Peace University, into the uh, extended version of Every Dollar, the world's best budgeting app. I'm going to pay for all of it. It's going to be free for you. But you have to promise me you're going to get in there and do everything we tell you to do. And one year from today, you're going to have a completely different life if you do that. Oh, my God, yes. I'm sorry. I told you she was ready, didn't yeah. I? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're awesome. I am so proud of you. Oh so you go through Thank Financial Peace so University. You drag boyfriend in there by the ear and uh, tell him he's going to watch it with you. And we're going to start getting our act together and get our life together and get this stress off of you. Okay. You're going to do this, Lucy. Yes. And when you do, I want you to call us back and you tell us your I story can't. and you do your debt free scream. Okay. Oh, my God. Yeah. You're going mean, to do this. We've been binge watching on YouTube. I've been listening to your podcast, and um, he has a sprained ankle right now, so he was stuck with me in my room all day yesterday while I was working. And I said, I'm going to play this because this is what I've been listening to while I work. And he's also been so motivated, and he's like, wow, this this puts puts you, like, in the right mind. Like, you know, and we want to buy a house and want to start a savings for our baby girl. So, I mean, I think... He's he's better with his money than I am, but um, I, I'm so ready for this. Thank you guys so much. You don't even know how much I appreciate this. Well, we are you honored to this. help you, kiddo. It's what we do, and you hang on. Kelly will pick up. We'll get you signed up, and you call us back anytime you yes. need help while you're walking through this, and call us back and when you score the touchdown and let us know, and we'll do your debt-free scream with you. How fun. That is so cool. I love that her boyfriend was a captive audience, and she's like, your ankle is sprained. I'm just going to play the Dave Ramsey <laughs> show for you, you while you're stuck. <laughs> you can't leave. Hey, that's going to be our new answer of how to get people Break on the their same ankle. page. Yeah. Break their ankle. <laughs> Hobble them. Hobble them, and they can't. How do I get my spouse on board? You hit their ankle That's with right. a sledgehammer. And then just press play. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love it. That's awesome. Les Brown, the great motivator. I was uh, did an event with him about, I was walking through the hallway of my picture with him back here the other day, and I stopped and looked at it because he's such a good man. He lives over in L.A. And um, he just says, you have to be hungry. <laughs> Yeah. You know, you have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yep. And people change their lives when they say, I've had it. I've had it. I've had it. And you know what? No amount of intellect offsets that. No. I no was... amount of academic discussion of some no. freaking theory offsets that. You have to get this <laughs> belly burning thing happening where you go, that's it. I'm not living like this anymore. This sucks. And when you change that, that's when it changes, doesn't it? I'm, you're, my favorite quote of you is, you can wander into debt, you cannot wander out. you got to get mad. I love yeah. it. you got to get fired up, man. And it's just a decision. And that's where Lucy is. She just decided. Yep. Yep. And then we stumbled across her path. How serendipitous. Thank you, Lord.
Christy Wright, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today as we talk to you about your life and your money in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage, baby! They're here! Nick and Brody are with us, uh, which can only mean one thing, they're debt-free. Hey, guys! Hi. Hi, Hi Welcome. Christy. Hi, Dave. Hi. Where do you guys live? Nome, Alaska. Whoa! Wow. Quite a trek. <laughs> you win the furthest traveled for a debt-free scream award. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. Very cool. And any excuse to get down south, huh? Right. <laughs> it was negative 30 with wind chill when we left, oh. which is uh, unseasonably cold. But it, I wow. I can't breathe. We're yeah. melting. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm so glad you're here. How much did you pay off? Two hundred and sixty-seven thousand eight hundred and forty-five dollars. Wow! How long did that take? Well, um, it took nine and a half years. Okay, and your range of income during that decade? We started off at seventy-five thousand, went up to one hundred and fifty, and then down to one twenty-four. Okay. What kind of debt was this? I'm guessing with that length of time and that amount of money, you might have paid off your house. We did. We did. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Looking at weird people! Oh, how old are you two weird people? I was 35 when we paid it off. We paid it off uh, three weeks before my 36th birthday. There you go. And I'm 39. Ding, ding. Well yep. done, you guys. What do you do in Nome, Alaska? I'm a court administrator. Mm-hmm. And I work for an airline. Okay. Yep. Very cool. Now, I've been to Anchorage. Where is Nome? I can't see it in my head. <laughs> it's uh, northwest of Anchorage, about 500 miles. Oh, uh, just a wee bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> you can north only fly. North of Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> Where do you live? North of Anchorage, yes. Okay, that'll work. Wow. Okay. Yeah, well, you can only fly half the places in Alaska. I heard they have more airline, uh, there are more people that have airline, li- air pilot's license than driver's license. <laughs> yeah. Might be true. Just, just I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I've heard wow. that. So, wow, man, very cool. So, what's this house worth? Two hundred and twenty thousand wow. dollars was what we paid for it. Yeah, it's at least two sixty now. Yeah. yeah, very good. And was the two sixty eight all the mortgage or other things too? We had about forty seven thousand in consumer debt when we first started. Mm-hmm. Um, paid that all off and in about seven months. Yep. And then we uh, lived life for a while. Um, after paying uh, off that debt, we moved. We uh, cash flowed that move. Um, we <laughs> bought a house. Bought a sold house, a house. Sold a house. <laughs> uh, so we saved for the down payment for this house. And then in 2015, we bought this house. And uh, we really weren't focused on paying it off like we were doing our budget every month Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. uh, we were throwing extra at the principal but I don't think either of us uh, Nick brought home a thermometer Mm -hmm. for us to fill in every time we paid it off we'd fill it in a little bit much more a lot of people do that but it takes on a new meaning in Nome Alaska (laughs) (laughs) well when Nick brought it home it just felt overwhelming Um, it it just was there was a lot of lines it it didn't seem like we were making much progress on it and uh, I think when it really kicked in was December of 2018 when we decided to throw a chunk of money at it and we were at the halfway mark oh (laughs) I can see the light like oh we can do this and um, before um, we really became focused around three and a half years ago when our daughter was born our oldest Mm -hmm. and we were like why are we just, you know, we're not really focused on the house. We're doing all these other things, buying gear. There's so much gear that you can buy for things in Alaska. Outdoor gear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pack rafts and um, snow machines, snow and, machines yeah. and four-wheeler. I mean, just you name it. And it's all expensive. It's oh, not yeah. cheap. Sure. And so we'd been cash flowing those different things. And then when our daughter was born, we were like, um, at different times before that, we'd kind of look at each other and be like, are you ready to pay it off? Really focus? And one of us would be like, no, look, a squirrel. <laughs> I want that thing over there. Let's do that thing. Then we'll do it. Yeah, yeah, then we'll do it. But once our daughter was born, we really dug in and uh, and we paid it off in February of this year. Uh, so how does it feel to be 35, 39 years old with a paid for house? That's I don't know be- if it's really sunk in yet. <laughs> <laughs> we just paid it off in February. And so April 1st was our first budget meeting where we didn't have a a mortgage payment right. for March or April. And so that, I think it's starting to sink in, but we're not, we haven't fully realized it. It's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a lot of money. 
Wow. Good for you. I'm so proud of you. Thanks. Very cool. Who are your biggest cheerleaders? Oh, man. You know, we were pretty private about the journey. Um, we've certainly talked to our friends about it, and um, the friends that we've talked to have all been like, wow, you guys are doing it. That's awesome. And But... Um, our parents have been supportive. Yep. My mom's taken yeah. Financial Peace University. We've taught a couple financial um, university courses. Thank you. Uh, so that keeps you on track. It really did. Yeah. When you yeah. start teaching it, you have to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah we I mean, like, you could go to the class and sort of do it, but when you teach it, you have to do it. <laughs> yeah, it forced us to do an insurance double check. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah like we that. had to, some updating to do on all that too. Yeah, very good. Very good. What do you tell people the secret to getting out of debt is? Uh, for me with the house, it was really patience, uh, cause we had, you know, been cash flowing things for a while and, um, having that large number and just breaking it down into small chunks and being able to, to, mm -hmm. to just be patient and wait. Um, yeah. How do you eat an elephant a bite at a right. time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that thermometer one yeah. line yeah. at a time. Yeah. That's so interesting too, because research shows that seeing progress is the most motivating thing. And once you guys got to the halfway mark, like it gave you that extra push. So it's just so cool to see how those small things all added up to you guys sticking with it. Wait, well done. That's amazing. Yeah. You just won't, you won't stick with it if you don't see the progress. Yeah. And that's, that's good. The incremental wins. That's so good. You guys, Woohoo! you did it. You are debt free house and everything. Completely You're so debt -free. weird. <laughs> I love it. And you brought the kiddos with you to yep. do the debt free scream. What are their names and ages? This is Lydia. She is three and a half years old. Ah, sweet. And this is Adrian. She, oh. she turned one a oh, week after we paid off the house. Oh, wow. Right. That's awesome. And we've got a pretty Lydia in our family, too. Oh, Not much very older nice. than that. Oh, know. yeah. Very cool, you guys. Congratulations. We've got a copy of Rachel Cruz's book for you, her latest New York Times bestseller, Know Yourself, Know Your Money. Nick and Brody and Lydia and Adrian. 268,000 paid off in nine and a half years, 75 to 150 to 124. House and everything, they are weird. Count it down. Let's hear a debt free scream. Three, two, one. We're debt free. <laughs> yeah. Good job, you guys. This is how oh, it's that's so done. Cool. That's so cool. Wow. Gosh, her face, it was like just the joy. It was just like you could oh, feel it. Man. Oh, my gosh. Well, what people don't realize is when you don't have that payment, you, it's a math thing for a while. It's kind of an emotional thing for a while. But when it's gone, it's a spiritual thing. Yeah. yeah. You feel something click in the spirit, you know, and you're like, I had no idea I was mm -hmm. a slave, and now I'm not. Yeah. The borrower is slave to the lender. There's something. Yeah, the freedom in that. There's a release. Yeah. Like that breath of cold mountain air. Yeah. They probably don't want to use cold air in their example yeah. with <laughs> Nome, Alaska. But, yeah, there's that sense of cleanliness going down into your lungs. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's this, like, I'm, wow, I'm in a whole different place. It, yeah, because you are. Yeah. Yeah, you're set up to win. And that's just the first step. That's right. You're living like no one else so that later you can live and give like no one else. So that you can put yourself in a position to win like you've never done before and completely change those babies tr family tree what great what a great young couple rock stars that's man. awesome that is so fun this is the ramsey show
question of the day comes from Blinds.com. Find out for yourself why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. You get free samples, free shipping, and with the new promos they run every month, you'll save even more. Use the promo code RAMSEY. It's magic. You'll get the best deal. Today's question comes from Shelly in Ohio. I'm a 52-year-old woman with a BA in art and MBA in management. I've been a stay-at-home mom for the last 10 years, but I'm ready to go back to work. I'd love to get into interior design. However, most jobs require design training, which I don't have. Our community college offers a two-year course, and I can cash flow their program. Is this something worth doing at my age? This is such an interesting question, and I think there's some different variables that I want to point out. First of all, at her age, I'm like, absolutely, you can do that if you want to, and you can cash flow. But what's more interesting to me is if you think you want to do it, I, I encourage people to do this a lot. How can you get some experience in that to make sure you want to do it before you go take the courses? Because even if you have to have some uh, education and training in this to do you know, a full uh, interior design full-time job, it doesn't mean you have to have that in order to get started or to intern or to shadow or to have some position where you could make sure this is what you want to do before you do it. So I would encourage maybe a baby step, but as far as her age, I'm like, no, you absolutely can do that. People switch careers. They have encore careers. What's the example of the, um, Colonel Sanders, the Kentucky 63 fried? years old before he ever, um, fried his first chicken, fried his first chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Not, I mean, there's a lot of grandma Moses never painted a painting until she was 88 years old. She did 1500 works of art before she died at a hundred. And so you're not done. Do you quit? Don't talk to me about your age. You're 52. I'm 60. You're pissing me off. So <laughs> you're not done here. You're not done. Yeah. But the, um, you know, the thing on interior design, uh, there's so many ways to get at that. And, and there are many, many, many world-class designers who never had a class mm -hmm. on interior design. Uh, they just, they had an eye for it, a knack for it, and they developed it uh, over time. They studied with and around other people, but they didn't necessarily go get a degree right. in interior design. There's a lot of them uh, that, that do very, very well. And, and you've got an MBA in business, so you know how to run the business right. part. Uh, so I, I, I'm with you. I think I would use that Ken Coleman proximity principle and let's find an interior designer in your area. And even if uh, you did something really weird, uh, you're not making any money right now. So why don't you just go work for them for free for yeah. 90 days and say, I want to prove that I'm worth having me around uh, uh, and then work for them for a year and learn how they do what they do. You're probably going to figure out that you can pick fabric. Yeah. Without yeah. a two-year degree. That's You're right. probably going to figure out you can pick a paint color without a two-year degree. And maybe maybe there's some, for example, maybe there's some program that a lot of interior designers use to mock up what a room would look like to present to a potential client. You learn that on the job or you learn that in this uh, company that you don't have to go get a degree to do anyway. So even if there is some technical aspect that you want to know that would help you, you might be able to just learn it there. Yeah, and almost in an apprentice mm -hmm. type of a setting. Yeah. Use that proximity principle. Yeah, I'm with you. I think I'd get my feet wet. Um, I don't think what you need is more education. I think you need some confidence. That's right. You're looking for confidence, and it's not found in education. It's amazing how many people ask me such a similar question, Dave, of, well, I need to go get another degree and another degree and another degree. And what they're really looking for is permission. They're waiting for some piece yeah. of paper that's going to give them permission. I'm like, you don't need permission to go do this thing, to go try this thing, to go help people and learn the, the degree you think is going to be your gateway of permission. And more often than not, it's you actually doing the thing that makes you feel the confidence you're looking for. You have a four-year degree in art. If you decide you're an interior designer, you just are one. You just decided. That's right. Just print you some business cards, That's right. baby. That's right. And then go pick some paint colors. And will you get better over time? Yeah. Will you stumble around a little bit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't know how to necessarily source the lines of furniture or the fabrics or the paintings or whatever is yeah. needed to, to decorate that home and make it look like Magazine City. But I think you probably know enough to start today. But if you want to build a little confidence, go work for somebody for a little bit. And, and, and getting your feet wet will give you not only the confidence, but it'll give you the skills. Dave, I think I took one class in college on speaking. And that's mm -hmm. just because it was a part of my business management program. You know how I learned how to be a speaker? It's by speaking for the last yeah. 10 years. Yeah. And, and, that's, and reviewing and every time you did a talk, right. watching the video watching and back, going, looking oh, at surveys. that sucked. I Learning, do that watching again. from other people. Yeah. It's just brutal to watch yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and it so, is. <laughs> you know, you go back and review your own work and yeah. any work, yeah. you'll find the errors yeah. more than anybody else will find them. And you'll correct, course, correct, course, correct, get better, get better, get better. That's called experience. Mm -hmm. And um, But you know how you become a writer? You write. That's right. 
you know how you become a speaker? You speak. You know how you become an interior designer? You in, do interior design. That's right. And uh, so I, I, there's not a license required. Uh, you don't need permission. You can just go. But if you need more confidence, then uh, we've decorated, oh, I can't think, I can't count now, uh, thoroughly decorated and or redecorated using five different decorators over the years mm -hmm. uh, or interior designers over the years, and some of them with uh, big-time credentials, some of them without. Uh, but, you know, what we cared about, we didn't care a thing about their credentials. What we cared about was the work that they had done and were going to do. Can you do a good job? And can I get there? And that's yep. all I cared about. Yep. I, I didn't, uh, you know... As a matter of fact, I kind of preferred they didn't have um, a long list of letters after their name from some school in France because that means they're going to charge me triple to pick <laughs> to go. I need a white wall. Well, I already knew they needed a white wall. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, so don't you know? I just I, I didn't you know. It's less joy for me that way. More joy for Sharon probably, but less joy for me. <laughs> so, uh, and that's not to say you can't learn things from um, in that field, but but. Um, but getting started is, is probably your best bet. Yeah, it's good. It's a big deal. Uh, Melissa is in Boise, Idaho. Hi, Melissa. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thank you. Hi, Dave and Christy. Hi. Um, hi. I moved from California to Idaho in 2017, and now I have a job I really love. But I kept my house in California, and I plan to retire in four years and maybe move back. But what I'm thinking now is, should I keep the house for the whole four years, sell it, and then put it into an investment property, and then just and pay cash for it and let it cash flow, and then I just rent and live around and travel around, or is it better to just have that as my primary residence? Or would you recommend I just sell it now? I'd sell it now. Why is that? Because I wouldn't long distance landlord for 20 seconds. It's a nightmare, and I own, a, I, own a, I own a bunch of rental property, and I don't recommend it. I just I don't recommend it, and I don't know what California real estate is going to do. It has done well in the past, um, obviously. It has also been uh, in my lifetime of 40 years, working lifetime of 40 years, watching real estate, it has been the most volatile market overall, uh, meaning it goes mm -hmm. way up, and then it busts, and goes way up, and then it busts. And with the number of people leaving that state right now, um, I don't know what's going to happen to prices there. I'm a little shocked, honestly, with the level of the level of uh, uh, exodus from California that prices haven't already gotten soft there. Uh, but they yeah, haven't. They haven't. No they're they're inventory. white hot. They, they're white hot. Yeah. So no inventory. Yeah. 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 No. It's no inventory anywhere in the United States. I mean, uh, so the COVID. Even even though even though you pay recapture right now, because if I. Right now, I'm using it as my primary and paying California taxes and I'm doing a roommate situation and gave them reduced rent. And I think if I wait until January to sell it, I won't have to pay 56000 in recapture. Or would you just take the... Well, if you wait till January and say 56000 I'll wait till January. But I'm not going to keep it five years. And, you know, I wouldn't have kept it in the first place. And so I'm going to begin the process of divesting and saying, you know, I'm going to live in Idaho. My investments are going to be in Idaho. And when I leave Idaho, my investments will also leave Idaho. And um, that that's what I would have you to do. Um, it's, ne it's all... Almost never, I mean, so close to never that I can just say never, a good idea to become a landlord by default. In other words, would you have gone and bought that house to use it as rental property while you lived in Idaho? Answer 1,000 times is no. I live in Idaho. I'm going to go to buy a house that looks like something I would live in in California for rental. No, you wouldn't do that. And so since you wouldn't do that, then keeping it is becoming a landlord by default. And it, it seldom turns out to be a great decision. Seldom. I mean, can you get out of it and make some money? Yeah. Yeah. And if you can 56000 help on the recapture by January, fine. I'm good with that. But but long term, I'm not holding that puppy. Thank you for the call. Christy, good show. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. This is The Ramsey Show. It's Kelly, associate producer and phone screener for The Ramsey Show. If you would like to do your debt-free screen live on the show, make sure you visit theramseyshow.com and register. We would love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story. This is 
The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage may mean you're an everyday millionaire. It's an everyday millionaire's theme hour. We want you to call in if you're a real millionaire. We're going to talk to you this hour, and for the rest of you, we're going to teach you what real millionaires do, not what your broke brother-in-law thinks. And not what some idiot hack political person with an axe to grind who wants us to move towards socialism thinks. We're going to teach you where real millionaires come from. Spoiler alert. You can do it. You can do it. When you live like no one else, later you can live as a millionaire and give like no one else. Now, because there are political idiots out there uh, and people who have entered the conversation in the name of wealth equality or inequality or whatever the discussion needs to be with that, uh, we have to address a couple of basic definitions. Millionaire is an accounting term. You don't get to make up your own definition. There is a singular one definition that is the truth. A millionaire is not someone that makes a million dollars a year. A millionaire is not someone that has a million dollars cash, although that person could also be a millionaire. Millionaire refers to billionaire, also refers to net worth. Your net worth is what you own minus what you owe. Now, various people in different accounting functions will include some assets and don't include some assets. I mean, you can put your clothing in there if you want, but your clothing's not really worth anything, so that's a bunch of crap, okay? So, but what do you actually own that you can turn into money, and what do you owe? What you own minus what you owe, your assets minus your liabilities equals your net worth. When you do that, in that bottom right-hand corner, that number is a million dollars or greater, you are a millionaire. It's not a feeling. I don't feel like a millionaire. It doesn't matter. million dollars isn't enough anymore. doesn't matter. We're not discussing feelings, and we're not discussing what's enough. We're telling you how you become a millionaire. It's when you have a $1 million or greater net worth. Does it solve all your problems? Well, crap, no. It actually brings you new ones. Okay? Does it? But, but one problem you don't have is you can afford the Tylenol for the headache. Okay? One problem you don't have is you don't have to worry about putting tires on your car anymore. One problem you don't have is you're not going to retire and retire and count on social insecurity to take care of your butt, uh, which is an absolute nightmare. You actually have some money. That's what a millionaire is. So we're going to talk to real millionaires, ask them what they did, how it's made up, and how they got there, because there's a lot of mythology around millionaires. The phone number here is 888-825-5225. I don't care how you became a millionaire. I want to talk to you because we want to tell real people what real millionaires do, how they did it, so that real people can say, I want to do it that way. If all of you won the lottery, then we'll all line up for the lottery, which, by the way, that isn't how it worked, okay? But, you know, whatever it is, we want to copy you millionaires so we can be one of you that's the purpose of this hour the everyday millionaire theme hour clint is our first millionaire up in chattanooga tennessee hi clint how are you i'm doing great dave how are you better than i deserve what's your net worth uh 1.3 million good for you break that down for me by category how much in your retirement how much in your house and so forth uh, we've got about 620000 in retirement savings. We've got uh, between our home and a piece of land we own, that's about 380000 And we've got 300000 in cash and other savings. Good for you. Well done. How old are you? 37 years old. Wow, young millionaire. So how much of this did <laughs> yes, you sir. inherit, sir? Uh, none. Zero. And what was your range of income, your best working year and your worst working year? 
Uh, best it would have been last year. We made about two hundred and twenty-five thousand. Um, and worst would have been when we first got married. We started at about eighty-four thousand. What do you guys do for a living? What do you do? Uh, I'm a vice president uh, of a construction company in the estimating side. Mm-hmm. And my wife, she's a um, quality manager at a major carpet manufacturer. Gotcha. And you have a four-year degree. We do. We both have bachelor's degrees. Okay. What's your degree in? Uh, construction management of and Brittany's is in industrial engineering and you're, and you're both using it good what's your gpa what yeah. was your gpa in college uh we were mid threes nothing okay. real good but nothing real bad either gotcha okay how much of this 1.3 million dollars in net worth at 37 years old do you think you have because you borrowed money to create wealth well i, I learned about you uh my senior year of college and i've seen debt as the arch enemy of wealth since then so zero <laughs> zero so you haven't leveraged your way into this so to speak okay no sir all right you did this really quick i'm very proud of you very impressive so there's a 22 year old guy who's in construction management listening to you right now how'd you do this in 15 years what do you tell him uh, well my my mom was going through financial peace university and handed me the cds uh, from the class and said you need to listen to this guy um, and it clicked as soon as I listened to it. And, um, I would say probably, uh, the number one thing would be choose your spouse wisely. Um, because, uh, yeah, if you've got, if you've got somebody right there, that, I'm just saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've got somebody that's willing to lock arms with you and claw, scrape, sacrifice to meet any goal, there's really nothing you can't do. And if you can eliminate the number one cause of divorce in your marriage early on, then, you know, the, the other things are minuscule compared to that. So Yeah, that's so impressive. That's very, very insightful. Um, okay, so sometimes people think that if you did this this quick, um, that, that you have had no life during the last 15 years. Do you all go on vacations, and have you enjoyed your life during the last 15 years? No, absolutely. There's there's portions of the baby steps where, you know, you're, you're sacrificing the fun of life uh, at times, but... Um, we, we do plenty of things and right now we do pretty much anything we want to do. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, man. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. You're making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, not a payment in the world and a million three net worth of 37. So that means that my guesstimate is you're probably going to be worth 10 to $20 million at 65. That would be the goal. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of mind blowing. Starting from nothing. So it absolutely can be done. That's the moral of the story, folks. So there he is, a construction management guy. He's not a star in the NBA. He doesn't have his own State Farm commercial. You don't know his name. And at 37 years old, he's worth $1.3 million. I'm telling you, folks, you can do this, and I'm going to continue to show you you can do it, and I'm going to continue to punch people in the mouth that say you can't do it. This is The Ramsey Show. We were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981 and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org backslash budget. We absolutely believe in it. Everyday Millionaire Theme Hour. This is The Ramsey Show. We're talking to real millionaires. Mythology is out there about where wealth comes from in America. 
by the way, you will hear on this show, and you will hear from the largest study of millionaires ever done in North America, airtight research, that the vast majority of millionaires did not inherit their wealth. As a matter of fact, 79% of the millionaires inherited zero. Another 5% inherited a small amount, like $5,000, not enough to make any difference at all towards becoming a millionaire. And another 5% inherited money after they were already millionaires. So let me help you with that. 79 plus 10 is 89. That's 9 out of 10 millionaires are not millionaires because of inherited money. That's a statistical fact, not a Fruit Loop writing a blog in his mother's basement. What's that matter? It matters because you can do it is what this says. And oh, by the way, in the top five uh, professions, teacher was number three in the largest study of millionaires ever done. Webster's with us in the lobby on the debt-free stage hey. to do his, to tell us about being an everyday millionaire. Yes, so sir. where do you live, here in Nashville? Tullahoma. Tullahoma, just down the road. Just okay. down the road. Yeah, I love it. I've got a lake house right down by yeah, there. Yeah, you should do. Yeah, cool stuff. So what's your net worth, Webster? $1.4 million. Good for you. And give me a little breakdown on that. Retirement, real estate, so forth. Uh, $250,000 is the house. Mm -hmm. uh, $1 million in retirement. Mm -hmm. And then 200000 in cash and a taxable investment account. Good for you. Well done. How old are you? 64. Great. So okay. then you're supposed to say, Webster, you don't look like you're 64. You don't look like you're 64, <laughs> Webster. You, you look like you're 30, I don't you like, like you're on your, You look like you're on the 32nd anniversary of your 32nd birthday. <laughs> and so um, what was your, what's your range of income in your working life? Your best year working, your worst year working? Well, Worst year was when I first started in IT in uh, 1977, mm -hmm. making a whopping $400 a month. Okay. And All right. $4,800 a year. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Up um, to a high of? 180 180 Good for you. Way to go. Very cool. So how much of the $1.4 million did you inherit? 200000 200000 Okay. Were you already a millionaire when you got that? No. Okay. So... We got out of debt uh, September 2005, mm -hmm. and then my in-laws were at their final stages of life, so mm -hmm. we got some gifts from mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And then in 2008, my father-in-law passed. Mm -hmm. We inherited the house that mm -hmm. was paid for. Mm -hmm. When we moved to Tullahoma in August of 2008, we sold that paid-for house. Mm -hmm. So we got a hundred and something thousand dollars for the house. Then plus other gifts. So from my wife's side of the family, we inherited two hundred thousand. Yeah, one hundred and sixty thousand. Gotcha. Okay. And then when my parents passed, uh, we got about another additional forty thousand. But by mm -hmm. that time, we were millionaires. millionaires. Okay, yeah. but you almost were before that. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. So I I think it it boosted you, but I don't think we say you are a millionaire because of inherited money. No. No. But it it, it definitely gave you a leg up. It definitely it started the the. Yeah. The first uh, money into the first IRA came mm -hmm. from the gifts from the in-laws. Cool. And you said your career was IT? IT. Okay. Very good. Very good. And uh, what was your GPA in college? Uh, I have no degree. No degree. Zero degree. So high school education? Yes. Okay. Good for you. And you wandered into IT in the 70s and have been self-taught since. Yes. And or courses or whatever, right? Yeah. A lot of certifications, a couple of hundred certifications. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Mainly because um, I listened to you. I, I've been listening to you since um, November 1999. Wow. And so over the years, listened to you, listened to others, uh, especially when Entree Leadership started. Yeah. Invest in yourself. Yeah. Invest in your skills. Mm -hmm. Invest in your knowledge. So when we started our – so our we just had our 20-year – Dave Ramsey anniversary on March 25th. Wow. So when we started, I was making 36000 a year. Okay. And then over the four and a half years that we paid off $197,000, uh, our average income was 48000 You know, there's an interesting insight there. And, and man, I really appreciate the history together. And um, I'm proud of that, that. I'm proud of you guys with what you've done. But here's the interesting insight. This idea that, okay, you ever just run a calculation, you say, if you invest this much a month, you'll be a millionaire. 
You know, if you just invest, if you invest $100 a month from age 25 to age 65 at 12%, it's one point, it's $1,176,000. Okay, so $100 a month, you know, so that, that'll make you think about where you spend 100 bucks, right? So you just run that. But here's the thing. It's never that simple. No. Because what's happened is, is the only way your money grew was you continued to grow. Yes. As a person. Yes. It was a holistic thing going on here. Your spiritual walk, your relationship, uh, your, your marriage, all of those things have to continue to grow and blossom as well, or the little math formula quits working, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you've grown you faster than this money grew even. Yes. Is what it amounts to. That's beautiful. I love that. I have never seen that before. That's a very interesting insight. So what advice do you have to a 25-year-old techie that's out there? Can they become a millionaire? Yes, they can. Um, My advice to my 25-year-old self would have been to have listened to a very wise woman that I knew at the time, Mrs. Campbell. She was Dave before Dave was Dave. (laughs) And her advice was always pay cash, never have debt, always save, and always invest for your future. Mm -hmm. And always give. Yes. Yeah. And I wish my pig-headed, stubborn, obnoxious, arrogant 20-something self would have listened to her. Yeah. Yeah, this would be four million. <laughs> but you did okay, Webster. Yeah. You still got a million four. I'm so proud of you. Congratulations, sir. Well, You're you. living the American dream. Thank you for taking thank time. You. Very, very nice. Brian is with us. Brian's in Raleigh, North Carolina. Brian, what's your net worth? Uh one point one million, Dave. Good for you. Give me a little breakdown by category on that. How much retirement, how much real estate, so forth. Sure. Um I'm pretty uh, re- real estate heavy. Um I got about eight eight fifty in real estate, mm-hmm. and then the remainder of that would be in retirement four one k. Okay, so like three hundred in that then, All right? Yeah, about that. Yeah. Good for you. How old are you? Uh, Twenty seven. Wow! Look at you, dude. Well done. So all this real estate's paid for? Oh uh, yes, sir. Wow. Um, all right. So tell me about yeah, this. What was your house. best year? I mean, in the four years you've been working, what's the best year, five years, seven years you've been working? What's your best year and worst year on income? Um, uh, best, just a little over 200. Uh-huh. Um, when I started out, maybe 60. Uh-huh. Okay. What do you do? Oh, but I got married in there too. So that, yeah. that adds a lot to it. Sure. Sure. What do you do for a living? Uh, I do IT work. IT, good for you. Okay. Well, there we go. Mm-hmm. And this is theme right here. And uh, how much of this money did you inherit? Uh, none of it, Dave. Other than, I mean, I got a car when I turned 16 at the average price. And uh-huh. the rest I've kind of worked on. I've done on my own. Okay. So did you get a four-year degree or are you working certs? Uh, no, I, I, did get a 40, I did get a four-year degree from the university. Yep. In uh, IT? Your science. Yeah, computer science. Oh, computer science. Yeah, okay. And what was your what was your GPA? Uh, about three point nine. <laughs> Good for you. Okay. All right. So tell me the story, because this is you did a large amount in a short period of time. It looks like every dollar you made went into paid for real estate. Yeah, um, I've always liked real estate. Um, I was really fortunate. I worked all through even middle school. I worked all the summers, high school. I worked uh, after work after school. I worked um, full time. Well, how old were you when you bought I, your first piece of paid for real estate? Um, I bought. Uh, I paid fifty percent down on my first house when I was uh, twenty one. Wow, way to go, Brian! Man, what a great story! Hey, thank you for sharing that. It's an everyday millionaire theme hour here on the Ramsey Show.
If you do not believe that you can become a millionaire, that you can build wealth in America today, there is a 1,000% chance that you will not build wealth. Because you will not go do the things that will cause you to build wealth because you don't think they're going to work. You think the game is rigged, that you don't have a chance to win. And you do have a chance to win. So it is my job to help you with your belief. And the way I do that is I use facts. Not mythology. Not political jargon. Not made up things. But detailed in-depth research and talking to real people who have become wealthy during their lifetime. One definition of wealth is your net worth. It is the most used definition of wealth to be a millionaire, what you own minus what you owe. So if you have at least a million dollar net worth and you're in that situation, call me. I want to tell people what everyday millionaires really look like, not what the media says, not what the left wing nuts say, because, oh, it, 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 there are systemic problems with our economy and the little man can't get ahead. You can't get ahead if you're a woman. You can't get ahead if you're a minority. You can't get ahead if you're a bald boomer, which would be me. You can't get ahead. I'm so stupid, guys, I had to do it twice. I was a millionaire by the time I was 28 and I lost everything because I was stupid. I borrowed up to my eyeballs. I got rich quick. I built a house of cards and it caved in. And I had to go do it again. The second time I did it, I did it using the principles I've taught you for the last 30 years since going broke. So I've done it twice. You can become a millionaire. You can build wealth in America. But see, a farmer that believes that if he plants seeds that no crop will grow would never plant seeds. That would be weird. You have, there requires a level of faith, a level of belief that if I plant something, I'm going to grow something. If I save and sacrifice and stay out of debt and actually be a grown-up, adults devise a plan and follow it, children do what feels good, then I can become a millionaire. If you do not believe that because the systemic problems in the economy, the, de the deck is stacked, and people say stuff like, I mean, I grew up, I heard people saying, the little man can't get ahead. Little man can't get ahead. You just work for the man. Like Eeyore's your freaking spirit animal. You're never going to get ahead. Life's rough. Oh, life's a, life's a beach and then you die. You know, oh my God, you defeatist, fatalistic idiot. But I tell you what, man, you don't have to be that way. You can choose to plant corn, and voila, corn will grow. If you save money, you will have some. If you stay out of debt and live on less than you make, you will eventually build wealth. Even if you screw it up, you'll eventually get there. Kevin is our next millionaire. He's in Mobile, Alabama. Kevin, what is your net worth, sir? Uh we just crossed the threshold, $1,042,000. Love it. Good for you. Give me a little breakdown on that by category. How much real estate, how much retirement, so forth? All right. We have right at, this is probably a low ball number, 300000 is our home mm -hmm. and it's paid for. Mm -hmm. uh, 680000 in our investments, 401k, IRA, Roth, IRA, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and then 62000 in our emergency fund, money market. You know, cash and other savings. How old are you? 60. I just turned 63. Good for you. And how much of this did you inherit? Zero. Okay. And what has been your working income, your best year range, and your worst year? Uh, well, last year was mostly my income. My wife retired in January of last year. My income last year was right at 80, probably 86,000. What did she make uh, when she was working? Uh, she probably making 60 plus. Okay. So you had a $150,000 household income as a high point. Yeah. Yes, sir. And what was your low point household income? Uh, probably, you know, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, you know, 40. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, what was your career? Well, I'm, I'm still working. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm, I work in, um, 
production, inventory, control, logistics, warehouse management, basically logistics and warehouse management. Gotcha. And do you have a four-year degree? No, sir, I do not. Two-year. Okay. In what? Uh, industrial management. Yeah, and then you used it. Good. Okay. And what yes. was your GPA in that two-year? Uh, I, well, I was up there. I was. I did it real late in life. I graduated when I was 50, so after all my squandered chances, I probably was right at 3.9, 4.0. Yeah, good for you. Yeah, because you actually understood what you're supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Like yes, sir. It. Good for you. Good for you. So what do you tell... A young man with a high school education who's working in logistics who can go get his two-year associates later, and he's running his career, can he still be a millionaire? Yes, sir. Um, you know, I, my story is kind of like yours. I messed up. In my 39 years old, I lost everything. Long story. I won't go there. But so I had the second half of my life, I've done a lot better. Bear Bryant is quoted as saying, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and guts between dreams and success. Another quote he says is, don't give up at halftime. Concentrate on winning the second half. And that's what I've done. Second half of my life, we buckled down and concentrated, and, and here we are. I've learned that heroes are not somebody you see on the movie screen wearing capes. Heroes sometimes wear hard hats and steel toed boots. Whining. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, good for you, man. Good for you. I'm proud of you. Well done. Well done. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you calling in and sharing your story. And congratulations on that break in that plane, baby. You did it. Touchdown. Woo. Yeah. Jessica is with us. Jessica is in Sacramento. Hi, Jessica. What's your net worth? Hi, Dave. Our net worth is $1.2 million. Good for you. And give me a little breakdown by category. How much real estate and retirement and so forth? So real estate, you know, we are in California. Mm -hmm. Our house is paid off, and it's worth just over six hundred thousand. Good. And then we have about six hundred thousand in Roth IRA, mutual funds, four hundred one ks, etc. Gotcha. And then about fifty thousand cash. Good for you. Well done. How old are you? I am thirty nine, and my husband is forty one. Good for you, young millionaires. Good. How much of this one point two did you inherit? Well, we were fortunate. We had uh, grandparents and great grandparents who left us a little bit of money. So about seventy thousand of that was from them. Uh, Fifty thousand though when, when I was eighteen, so there wasn't much left after very long. Okay. <laughs> so are you a millionaire because of this inheritance, or it gave you a boost? It gave us a boost. Okay, but it, you you obviously didn't inherit a million dollars. Okay, and no, your sir. income range. What was your best? Your household income and your worst year household income since you've been working? Our worst year was when we both got off of active duty, and it was about 15000 And our best year was this last year, about 243000 Cool. What do you do for a living? I am a registered nurse and an Air Force Reservist. Okay, cool. And obviously you have a nursing degree. What was your GPA? Yes, from that degree was 4.0. 4.0. You got it. Get after it. I love it. Okay, so a young nurse is out there. You're a young nurse, but even younger, just coming out of school, passing her boards, can she still become a millionaire? Absolutely. What do you tell her to do? Quick. Uh, choose your life partner wisely and always move at the speed of cash, avoiding debt like the plague. Love it. Move at the speed of cash and avoid debt like the plague. You're listening to real millionaires who have built real wealth. This is not theory. These are real people that are doing it. You can too. This is The Ramsey Show. Scripture of the day, Proverbs 13, 11, dishonest money dwindles away, 
but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Oh. Stephen King said, what separates the talented individual from the successful one is a lot of hard work. Well, that's true. When people are hurting, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to get the guidance and the resources they need to get better. And that's why we do this every day. We help people. Over the past year, my team's been really working hard building a brand new website that makes it so much easier for you to find all the different things you need, the content, the tools, the products, the services you need to win in any aspect of your life, not just money, but everything. And guess what? It launches this week. It's called RamseySolutions.com. No kidding. So instead of DaveRamsey.com, we are now RamseySolutions.com. It's slick. It's your one-stop shop for everything Ramsey. You'll find all our Ramsey personalities there, including Rachel, Ken, Anthony, Christy, Dr. John, and of course me, all in one spot, and all the things having to do with us with no wild goose chase. So just go to RamseySolutions.com, check it out, surf around a little bit, see what's happening at the new site. It's beautiful, and it's easy to find stuff. Uh, the other one had been built like a country house. We just kept adding rooms over the years and the architecture was just a wee bit unstable to say the least so we're so excited about how strong and powerful and easy this new one is just for you guys so well done this is a millionaire theme hour as we talk to real millionaires people with a million dollar net worth or greater to get from them how they've lived how they did that to convince you that you too can do this ryan is in indianapolis ryan what is your net worth uh, 1.1. 1.1 million. Give me a little breakdown yep. on that uh, mix uh, between everything. 200 farmland, uh, 350 retirement, 450 uh, equity in the house, 100,000 in investments, and the rest is miscellaneous cars, toys. Good for you. How old are you? 35, and my wife's 41. Wow. Young millionaires today. Lots of them. Uh, how much of this did you inherit? Zero. Okay. And what was your best household income working year and your worst household income working year? Um, <clears throat> zero, and uh, we're about 200 now. Cool. What do you all do for a living? Uh, I expedite freight. My wife works. Uh, she's an orthopedic surgical manager. Okay. All right. Cool. And you have a four-year degree? <laughs> no. No degree. Uh, my wife has a bachelor's. So you got a high school and she's got a bachelor's. Correct. Okay. Cool. Cool. So how do you become a millionaire at thirty five? What's the secret? Um <laughs> uh, there is no secret. You just gotta work hard and uh save. Um I, I think that as long as you're having fun, working hard, sacrificing and pretending like it's eighteen hundreds, you don't ever need to borrow money and uh you just let it live below your means. Um uh, before we had kids, there were stints where I'd work 16 to 20 hour days and we were living in a rented trailer. And, uh, we did that to build a solid foundation and to save, uh, to build our house. Okay. And, and you've got a paid for farm and a house with a bunch of equity in it, a bunch of money mm -hmm. in retirement, all at 35 years old. Yes, sir. Yeah. Way to go, man. That house, we just saw a picture of it pop up on YouTube. It's beautiful. That's a good looking house, man. Well done. I love it. Congratulations. I'm proud of you guys. Okay, so today all of the net worths were slightly over a million, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.1. There are no $10 million calling it a day, no $5 million or even $2 million calling it a day. But the ages were unusually young today, 37, 27, 41, 35, and 64 and 63. Uh, by the way, the statistical average of a millionaire in America today is 52. On average, it took them 17 years to get there from the time they got their crap together and started working on it. Okay, because we all, a lot of people go through the, you know, the blue period where they just do stupid stuff. Like I lost everything in my 20s, I had to start over, right? Uh, and so then 17 years later, quicker than 17, I had my next million back. They always say the second million's easier. You know it is? You know why it is? Because you've done it and you know you can do it. When you've never done it before, you don't know you can do it. You think you can do it. You see other people do it. You think, I can. this is going to work. You can do the math. You can do the projections. But once you've lived in it and done it, you felt it, you walked in it, you go, oh, yeah, I can do that. And then you go, well, I need, you know, I think I need to work on 10 million. And then I need to work on 30 million. And then you need to, you know, you just, once you've done it, 
you know, you, what's the next thing you're going to do? What's the next process? And, and so these guys did it. And by the way, out of them, uh, one of them inherited 200, one of them inherited 70. Both of them said those were booster seats. They were not the reason they became a millionaire, but it did help. And obviously, if you get 100 or 200,000 or something like that, it does help you become a millionaire. But let me tell you what the mythology is. If you do take a mic and go down the street, the man on the street interviews, right? And you say, tell me about wealthy people. Well, they inherited their wealth. And see, if you believe that and you don't have a rich uncle, that means you're screwed. So why win? Why go out there and save? Why go out there and try to be successful? Because the only way to be wealthy is inherit your money. The game is rigged. And if you don't happen to win the DNA lottery in a wealthy family, you're not going to get there. That's, what, that's the problem with that mythology is it destroys hope. And the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Here's another one. Wealthy people are all crooks. That's how they got their money. Well, I didn't talk to any crooks today. I talked to a construction manager, a couple of IT guys, a logistics guy, a, a, a nurse, and, and, a, and, a, and a guy who's a freight distributor. I didn't talk to any crooks. There were no, no, no movies going to be made about these people stealing. Bernie Madoff was not on the show today. So this idea that wealthy people are all crooks is insulting to those of us that saved and worked our butts off and didn't steal a dime and provided service to the marketplace. Pisses us off when you say that. Quit saying it. It's wrong. It's a lie. Well, all wealthy people are famous people. They're entertainers, they're rock stars, country music stars, they play professional sports. The statistically, less than 1% of America's millionaires are uh, recognizable names due to them being in the spotlight. They're not professional athletes, statistically. Less than 1% are actors, entertainers, professional athletes. And I've worked with the NFL We've worked with the NHL. We've even worked with the NBA a couple of times. And let me tell you what the NFL stands for. Not for long. Their average career length is 3.7 years. The number of guys that become millionaires playing football is very low. And a lot of them, as we all know, screw that up. Oh, in order to be a millionaire and be wealthy, you have to be inordinately brilliant. Another lie. GPAs today were all in the threes except one 4.0. No one had six PhDs. No one had them all with 4.0s. No one invented a, 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 a chemistry formula that's going to get them the Nobel Peace Prize. These are working people that lived on less than they make doing IT, nursing, logistics, and construction management. Now, let me just tell you, too. I will tell you that the average millionaire is above a 2.5 GPA because they applied themselves to their studies. They had a level of discipline. By the way, if you go to class, most of the time you get a 2.5. If you just go to class, I mean, really, and quit playing beer pong, I mean, just go to class and you'll get a 2.5. But most of us that are wealthy are not 4.2s. My GPA was 2.97 in college. Yes, I'm pissed off about the three one-hundredths of a point. I missed it by three one-hundredths of a point. So, but you know what? Hadn't held me back at all. I've done okay. The point of this Everyday Millionaire Theme Hour is you can do it, and you should do it, and I fully expect you to do it, and I want to hear from you on this hour when you do it. I want to celebrate you. You're America's heroes. That puts this hour of the Dave Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Have a friend or family member that needs a daily dose of Ramsey advice in their life? Let them know about the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast. It's a quick hit of advice about life and money in under 10 minutes. Check out the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast wherever you listen to podcasts.